Welcome to the 2016 All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. These webinars are brought to you by the eight extension communities of practice, imported fire ants, and urban IPM, and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Clemson Cooperative Extension System, and the University of Georgia. My name is David Kuhn, and I will be moderating this webinar today along with Lucy Edwards and Marcus Garner from the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service. Um, Last week, we had a wonderful webinar on Don't Let the Insects Eat Your Vegetables, uh, presented by Dr. Avenai from the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. This week, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. J Jason Oliver, who will be uh, presenting on Kill the Queen the First Time, Tips for Making Fire Ant Mountain Treatments. Before we get started, a few uh, housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the webinar, please type those in the chat box to the left. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be four poll questions. Please answer those, and there will also be a link to a Qualtrics survey. Please click that at the conclusion and complete that survey and give us some feedback into, into how these webinars are going and what you would like to see in the future. Again, today we have Dr. Jason Oliver from Tennessee State. Uh, he is a research associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences through the College of Agriculture, Human Resources, and Natural Sciences. Jason's uh, research areas include integrated pest management, biological control, semi-chemicals trap development, and his insect focus work groups include Japanese beetle, imported fire ants, and wood boring beetles. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Oliver and let him get started on the fire ants. Dr. Oliver? Thank you uh, for the introduction there. and. Before I get started, too, I'd like to thank E-Extension and all the organizers for this opportunity to uh, present to everyone. And with that, I'll advance to the slides here. Um, I tried not to make this talk too data intensive today, but I do have a few data slides in the talk that I will show later on as I get to them. Um, start off here with my title slide, too. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Anne-Marie Calcott with USDA APHIS and some of my colleagues here at Tennessee State University, Carla Desso, Nadir Youssef, and Paul O'Neill, and also our research staff that helped me with some of the photos in this presentation, and we're also involved with some of the data that I'll show you later on. Uh, can everyone hear me okay, too, through my speakerphone before I get too far into this? Um, okay. See a yes there. I'll start off with a uh, short... Uh, history of imported fire ants, just to kind of get everybody up to speed with where they're coming from. Uh, they originate from South America, introduced into our country almost 100 years ago now, and uh, probably through the Port of Mobile. And since that time, they've expanded their range significantly to almost 275 acres. And they are a regulated pest. There is a federal imported fire ant quarantine that's been in effect since 1958. Uh, there are actually two species of imported fire ant in the United States, uh, the red imported and the black imported, and both of these species will also uh, cross to produce a reproductively functional hybrid fire ant. In addition, you might encounter uh, other native fire ants that are in the United States. Uh, most of these are in the southern U.S. and southwestern U.S., uh, tropical and southern probably being the most common in the southern areas. By far, the imported species are the ones that cause most of the problems. And just a few tips for recognizing fire ants. Uh, these could be handy for um, knowing what you're treating. I mean, it's important, obviously, know that you are treating fire ants if you're trying to um, control the pest. Uh, if you look at the ant itself, uh, close up with the hand lens, it has two nodes between the thorax and the abdomen. Uh, these give the ant greater flexibility when they're stinging. Uh, some other close-up pictures here of the stinger. Uh, it's, it's essentially almost like a hypodermic needle for injecting venom. Uh, the ant itself on the head has two distinct compound eyes. And I point that out because some ant species don't even have compound eyes. So if you have an ant that's lacking compound eyes, it's definitely not a fire ant. Uh, Ten-segmented antenna with a two-segmented club. 
And another thing that's kind of interesting with fire ants is this dimorphism of worker size. You'll end up with all different sized workers sometimes in colonies. Here's a close-up shot of the stinger on the fire ant with a drop of venom uh, coming out of the stinger there. Some other characteristics, uh, most people are probably familiar with the shape of the mound, uh, resembles a volcano. Uh, surfaces are commonly reworked, especially after rain, so you get this granulated uh, fluff appearance on the surface. Uh, no external exit holes except during mating flights. Uh, at that time, the workers will open up the mound to allow the reproductive stages to exit the colony. So if you see a ant uh, colony basically with uh, a central entrance hole or something like on these four pictures here, it's not going to likely be imported fire ants. If you break open the mound, there's an internal network of tunnels, almost gives a honeycombed appearance. And this is important for regulation of temperature within the mound and also for allowing movement of the ants within the mound. Uh, fire ants are, as everyone knows that's encountered them, fairly aggressive. Um, they readily swarm up on anything that comes in contact with the colony or disturbs the mound. Um, it's obviously, if you're in an area with fire ants, it's a good idea if you step on something soft, that's usually the first indicator that you might be standing on a fire ant mound. Uh, it's definitely something that you uh, don't want to stay in the same position very long or they'll let you know. They uh, both bite and sting. They use the mandibles to hold on while they're stinging. And they actually, their abdomen is flexible enough that they can hold on to one position and sting in multiple locations without actually releasing their bite. Uh, the sting itself will resemble uh, almost a smallpox appearance. Uh, typically, you'll get a white pustule after about 24 hours. It somewhat depends on how much venom is in injected into you and as well as the type of fire ant. Uh, I usually don't get much of a reaction with the black imported and the hybrid imported fire ants that are common in my area here in Tennessee when I get stung. Just some tips about where to look for fire ants uh, in your landscape settings. Um, I commonly see uh, in areas where there's dirt roads or loose soil, a lot of times you'll find these little foraging trails um, where the ants have removed soil to make an easy path where they can stay mostly subterranean. And a lot of times these are handy because if you spot one of these, you can follow it right back to the, the parent colony and, and treat the colony. Usually you're going to find fire ants out in open areas. They like full sunlight. You, I commonly see them on embankments. Uh, roadsides are excellent places for fire ant colonies, uh, especially southern facing embankments where they get plenty of sunshine in the winter months. In hot dry weather, mounds will sometimes uh, retreat into shady areas, but this Typically is not the habitats you normally would find mounds, but again, if it's really dry or really hot, they sometimes will do that. They also like heat sinks near uh, sources of concrete, uh, rocks, tombstones, um, anywhere that they can provide, you know, obtain extra heat during the winter months. And these are some of the more challenging places to treat because a lot of times part of the colony will be up underneath the structure where they're somewhat uh, inaccessible to any treatment that you apply. They also like sites with adequate moisture, so it's not uncommon to find mounds near uh, lakes and ponds and long creeks. Uh, often find them near uh, objects in the landscape, stumps and fence lines, uh, landscaping beds. And a lot of times that's happened because the mound has been repeatedly disturbed by lawnmowers or other equipment, and then they move to these areas where they have less disturbance on their colony. And a couple of shots here. Uh, this upper shot corner or picture in the left shows a roadside. At this particular site, there was no mounds anywhere in the mowed area, but all of the mounds were in the taller vegetation where they had moved away from the repeated uh, disturbance. The bottom left picture is very typical of uh, where you would expect to find fire ant mounds. Uh, to the left, uh, 
the site is being actively mowed and most of the mounds have retreated to the edge along the fence line there. So again, that's just something that might be useful for treating the mounds, knowing where they're all going to be located in most of the situations if there's a lot of disturbance going on. Now, this was actually a field-grown nursery in my area, and all of the fire ant mounds were in the nursery rows. Uh, they were avoiding the aisleways where there was equipment moving and tilling and mowing the site. So and they're very good at moving away from disturbance. Just a few tips about general biology and mating that uh, also hopefully will help with uh, knowledge of treatment. Uh, again, these, these mounds, the below ground portion typically is a network of honeycombs and tunnels and the visible mound on the surface uh, sort of functions almost like a solar collector. It, it heats up during sunlight, sunny days uh, allows the colony to benefit from that. Uh, periodically, uh, once the colony reaches uh, maturity, it will begin to produce winged reproductives, and these will mate in the air. Uh, the females on the left in this picture and the males on the right, uh, the males have very small heads compared to the females. After mating, the female drops to the ground and loses her wings and will enter the soil. The males die after mating. She then forms a small chamber underground, begins laying eggs, uh, initially feeds her larvae with oil secretions that she produces as she digests her wing muscles that she no longer needs. And eventually you get your first crop of very small workers that are typically called minims. And all this is taking place, it's almost 30 days before the first workers actually appear on the surface of the ground. Uh, so this is one of the challenges with managing fire ants is dealing with these reproductives that are flying into the site and they're not feeding during that 30 day period so they're not going to be susceptible to certain types of treatments like baits. And eventually a small mound will be produced by these workers. It, this may not be visible for several months, uh, could be even longer in hot dry weather. And as the colony grows, you'll begin to get larger classes of workers being produced called majors, uh, more extensive tunneling formed, and the mounds become more distinctive. And eventually you have another mature colony. Uh, the mound is large enough and has enough resources to begin to produce reproductives. And you end up with mating flights repeating from this mound. Uh, once the colony is uh, mature, I mean, a queen can be producing 2,000 eggs a day and up to 6,000 reproductives a year. So that's quite a bit of reproductive potential. Um, say you have a moderate number of mounds per acre, like 50 mounds. Um, if each of those mounds is producing 6,000 reproductives, that's over 300,000 reproductives coming out of uh, an acre a year. And we do have states in the south that probably commonly have densities as high as 50 mounds per acre. So this is one of the challenges with managing fire ants is the reproductive potential. Uh, makes it very difficult to uh, eradicate them for sure. That's going to, we're looking essentially at a management situation, not an eradication situation. And the queen herself can live up to seven years. Once she dies, the colony will basically die, so any treatment that we apply that kills her can eliminate the colony. Um, I will point out there's one exception to this. Uh, some colonies have multiple queens, and I'm not going to talk much about that today, but um, in a situation like that, eliminating one queen wouldn't necessarily eliminate the colony. I'm moving on to the actual management part of this talk. Um, as we've already kind of learned, looking at what we've seen so far, there's basically two targets you're looking at when you're trying to manage fire ants. Uh, you have these existing colonies that are on site. These are typically vis uh, visible and have workers that are actively foraging and bringing resources back to the colony. And then you have these newly mated queens that are being released by mounds and flying into sites. Um, these are not going to be readily visible to the average person, and they don't feed initially. so. For about 30 days, you uh, cannot target these with certain types of treatments like baits, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, just a few uh, things that are not useful for controlling fire ants or actually harmful. Um, I always like to show.
show these in talks. Uh, you see these a lot on the internet. Uh, certain sites will recommend them, and I just wanted to point these out that these are not effective methods for managing fire ants. Uh, grits and rice will not work well, will not work at all on fire ants because the only stage of the fire ant that actually digests solid food is the fourth instar larva. So even if a grit was toxic to a fire ant, um, the only thing you would eliminate in the colony would be the fourth instar larva. All the other stages are feeding on liquids, so that's not going to be an effective method. Uh, shoveling mounds together doesn't work well. The, the ants will fight a little bit, and then the colonies will just separate into new new mounds. You might even end up with more than a couple of mounds after that. Uh, soap, wood ash, and club, so club soda have no effect. Neither does baking soda. The two things on the far right there, gasoline and bleach, actually might kill fire ants. Uh, gasoline will kill fire ants for sure. The only problem with it uh, is it's, it's flammable. It's not labeled for this type of usage pattern. It's very expensive. It can potentially damage groundwater, and it's not a good method for managing fire ants. So don't do these. Use uh, insecticides. There are a lot of products registered for fire ant control, and I didn't even want to get into talking about all of them. What I wanted to do here was give you a link to the e-extension website uh, that lists all of the different types of products that you can find. There's probably uh, 200 products registered for fire ants. Um, there are not that many active ingredients. A lot of these uh, products are the same ingredient. They're just uh, different trade names. But they all fall into two broad groups. We have baits and contact insecticides. The bait incorporates a food attractant, which is typically soybean oil, with a carrier, which is typically corn grit, which gives it a yellow and uh, a toxicant, which uh, can be one of several different compounds. Um, the food itself draws the workers to the bait, and the toxicant is absorbed into the soybean oil, so as they feed on that, they, they consume the toxicant. Uh, contact insecticides do not require the ants to forage. Uh, they can kill the insect either on contact or when the insect is feeding or grooming itself, such as uh, preening its antennae or uh, feet, it ingests the, the toxicant. So a little bit of differences between these two types of compounds. Uh, the baits do require foraging to be effective. Uh, the contact insecticides usually are it's irrelevant whether the ants are foraging. Uh, baits can be ruined by rain. Uh, if water gets in contact, it'll separate the, the toxicant uh, and the oil from the carrier, so that's not a good thing. Um, with the contact insecticide, it's usually unimportant. Uh, both can have short to long residuals. Uh, baits usually don't have very long residuals. Again, if they come in contact with moisture from dew or rain, a lot of times they're inactivated. Uh, both will control existing colonies, but only contact insecticides are going to be effective on these alates, these reproductives that are flying into the site. Uh, baits will have no effect on them because they don't feed initially until the colony produces workers that can bring food back to the colony, to the queen. There's a few programs that have been uh, kind of recommended for management of fire ants. Uh, the first one, uh, Depends on your situation, but an individual mound treatment program, this is where you go out into the site and you just treat the colonies that you find directly. Um, this is usually done with uh, some type of drench. Uh, there's several insecticides labeled for this. Again, you can find these on the extension website. I, I tried to avoid talking specifically about specific chemicals because I know there's a lot of people possibly from different states on this webinar and different chemicals are labeled for different states and have different use patterns in different states. So I, I really think it's best to not speak so much specifically about chemicals but direct you to that e-extension uh, website that I gave earlier. But basically with any of these uh, treatments, if you're drenching the fire ant colony, it's best to sprinkle that from a fairly good height, about three feet, because you want the chemical to break through the crusty soil of the fire ant mound. Um, 
You can also sprinkle granular or wettable powders directly on the mound. But if you do this, it's usually best to follow that up with some type of watering to uh, move the active ingredient from the granular into the, the colony, the mound itself. And some baits also have labels that allow you to sprinkle the bait, uh, a couple of tablespoons of bait around the mound. Uh, you usually do this about a three foot, three to four foot diameter circle around the mound. And in the past, there's been a lot of debate about whether the bait should go on the mound or all around the mound because fire ants actually exit from lateral foraging tunnels uh, around the mound. But the ants also forage readily on the surface of the mound, so I really think it's not that important. It's just important to distribute the bait all around the mound. Um, this individual mound treatment approach, the, the limitations to it, um, it's not going to be real practical if you have to treat large numbers of mounds. It's not going to be very effective for finding small colonies. Uh, you're likely to miss those. Some of the benefits of it, though, is you can serve your natural or your native ants that are at the site because you're only treating the fire ant mounds and you're not treating the whole area. Um, another problem with those reinfestation is likely to be a problem because you aren't treating the whole area. Uh, to and this, this slide here shows uh, what I was just talking about there a second ago uh, with how to treat a mound. Uh, it is important to this crusty, hard surface that typically forms on a fire ant mound. A lot of chemicals will just roll right off of that if you start drenching. So it is good to drench from a fairly good height, but also I like to actually break the surface of the mound up a little bit before I start the drench to allow the chemical to get into the mound where the ants are at. And again, um, probably about two to th two gallons is optimal. Uh, I would do at least a gallon on the mound and a gallon over uh, about a three foot diameter area when I was doing this type of treatment. Anything less than two gallons uh, doesn't always work that well. And I've got a little bit of data here to show that. Um, this was a chemical test that we did a few years ago. The y-axis on this graph over here shows percent colony control on a scale of zero to 100%. So any, any bar here at 100% is good control. Uh, I had a control treatment and also a treatment that got half a gallon, one gallon, or two gallons. All of them got the same chemical at the same rate. And half gallon treatment, uh, we did not get 100% control until 10 days after treatment. Um, but the one and two gallon treatments worked fairly well. So I only wanted to show this data slide just to point out that I do think it's important when you're drenching a fire ant mound to use at least a minimum of one gallon up to two gallons of drench solution. And the other program that's often recommended for managing fire ants, uh, initially I believe was developed by Texas A&M, it's called the two-step method. And this one is a little more effective when you're treating large numbers of mounds greater than 20 per acre. It involves a broadcast bait treatment applied spring and fall, which is the optimal time for baiting. And then this is followed up with an individual mound treatment three to seven days after baiting. And this is done just to eliminate large mounds that the bait doesn't uh, eliminate immediately. And the reason you want to wait uh, three to seven days you want to make sure the ants have a chance to forage on the bait before you go out and start uh, applying contact insecticides. That gives uh, time for the product to reach the queen in the colony and ensure that the queen has been exposed to poison before you actually begin doing individual mound treatments. Um, again, this program is usually good for when you have large numbers of mounds per acre. The bait increases the likelihood that you're going to get the small mounds that are difficult to, uh, to find and it's a little less labor intensive. And the contact insecticide works effectively for eliminating these large nuisance colonies that the baits can't rapidly eliminate. Um, now the problem with this one though is your re reinfestation is likely gonna happen because newly mated queens flying into the site will not be affected by the baits. And eventually um, you're gonna end up with some reinfestation with this method as well. Third program is use of a long residual insecticide. And this program has the bait treatment as an option. 
but it's still always good to use a bait because they're very effective at getting at these small colonies that are often hard to spot. Um, however, the, face, the really important aspect of this program is the broadcast insecticide. Uh, it's done, again, two to three days post-baiting. Uh, a couple products that are commonly used with this are pyrethroids or fipronil. And here we're looking at about a six month to one year uh, residual control with uh, these treatments. Uh, some disadvantages of this method, unfortunately, is if you're broadcasting an insecticide over a whole area, you're definitely going to be impacting your native ants, which are beneficial. Uh, you're going to uh, possibly have more environmental effect because you're putting more chemical over a bigger area. However, advantages of this treatment, um, you do tend to get longer residual control of fire ants. Newly mated queens flying into this site will continue to be poisoned. And um, that's, that's all I can think of, I guess, on that. Cost-wise, uh, if we look at just the chemical costs of these different programs, we're looking at, uh, for the individual mound treatment, about $13 an acre about 26 for the two-step method, and the long residual broadcast is the most expensive, probably around 150 to 200 an acre. Um, none of these costs I'm showing right here actually include labor. So um, we're looking at just the chemical cost here. The individual mound treatment and the two-step method will be a little more expensive because there's more labor involved with actually going out and finding individual mounds. Some other tips uh, for optimizing bait and contact treatments. Uh, with baits, uh, it's very important that uh, you follow the label. I mean, you always want to follow the directions on the label because it is the law, but baits have a lot of requirements in order for them to work. And, and the chief reason they have so many requirements is because they require the ant to actually forage. And if, you, if the ant's not foraging, the bait is not going to be effective. And the first one is uh, soil temperature. Uh, you want to be above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and the optimal range is probably 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if it's hotter than that or colder than that, the ants aren't going to be foraging effectively, and so the bait's not going to be picked up. Uh, expiration dates are extremely important with baits because um, the soybean oil portion of the bait can go rancid with time. So following the recommendations on the label for how long you can store the bait after it's been opened is important. Also not storing your bait in areas where there's lots of odors like gasoline or other strong chemical odors that might make the bait unpalatable to the ants if it's absorbed into the bait product. You obviously don't want to disturb mounds when you're applying baits. You want the ants to be out, out foraging and not busy repairing their mounds. Uh, you want to apply when the ants are actually out foraging, and a good way to do that is to test the bait. Um, put a small amount of bait near a fire ant colony and, and come back about 30 minutes later and see if the ants are actually picking the bait up. Yeah, at the same time, you would want to put out a potato chip or spam or a piece of hot dog and see if the ants are on the, the food product as well. If the ants are only on the food product and they're not picking the bait up, that's probably a good indication that there's something wrong with your bait, such as the bait may have gone rancid or it's out of date. If the ants are picking up both the food product and the bait, then that's a good indication that that's an excellent time to be baiting. You also want to apply baits when there's no rain expected and when the foliage is dry because, again, the rain can mess up the bait by separating the toxicant from the carrier. And I like to designate spreaders that I use for baits for fire ant bait only. That way I'm not using fertilizers or other insecticides in these spreaders that might make the bait un, uh, unpalatable to the ants. And it's a good idea to clean your equipment after applying a bait uh, to brush out any leftover bait or use compressed air. And be careful if you're using compressed air uh, to put safety glasses on because you don't want to blow the bait into your eyes. Um, but uh, you don't want to leave bait in the hopper of the spreader that you're using because if that oil goes rancid over time, again, the next bait treatment you apply could be uh, not, not taste as good to the ants, essentially. 
It is important to calibrate uh, your bait spreader just like any uh, pesticide spreader to make sure you're putting the right amount out. Um, baits are a little bit friendly. If you put too little out, the ants are still going to find it. They're very effective, but uh, most baits are labeled for 1 to 1.5 pounds per acre, and applying more bait than that doesn't do anything more than cost you more money. It's not going to provide any better control, and it's also going to be a violation of the label. Uh, to calibrate a spreader, you really only need to know a few things. You need to know how much time it takes to cover a fixed distance. Usually I'll do mine at about 100 uh, feet. Uh, you need to know how wide your spreader is throwing the bait, whether that's a hand spreader or a mechanical spreader like a herd spreader that's mounted on this tractor. And the good way to do that is to back up to like a bare dirt area, run the spreader for a few seconds, and then... Uh, measure what the, how wide the swath pattern is for the, the throw of the spreader. The other thing you need to know is how much time does it, how much bait is actually released during the same amount of time it took to drive step A up above there. So however long it takes to drive a fixed distance, you catch bait for that amount of time and weigh it, and then you know what your output rate is for that given area. If you know all of these different things, you can apply a formula and it will tell you how many pounds of bait per acre you're putting out. I'm not going to go into this formula because the extension has made this easy. Uh, if you go onto their website, um, they have several spreader charts for different ground speeds and different types of settings on your spreaders. So these are very useful for um, estimating how much bait you're putting out. I've also got a publication online that you might find useful. Um, this publication has a couple of charts in it. Uh, one of them is in, in ounces. Um, turn on the clicker here. I also have this, this publication has the charts in ounces as well as in grams. And um, the top line up here is ounces that were caught. And over here we have uh, the swath width and the length of the area that you drove in your test thing. So say you caught uh, 0.2 ounces of bait and you had a swath width of 12 feet and a length area of 100 feet. We go over here, we find out if you caught uh, 0.2 ounces, your spreader was putting out 0.54 pounds per acre. The yellow area on this chart is 1 to 1.5 pounds, which is our usual target um, for most spreader applications. So this is something uh, that might be useful to you. Um, I, I use the chart myself a lot, so I don't have to sit there with a calculator and calculate how much bait I'm actually putting out. Uh, for contact insecticides, just like baits, uh, there's an optimal temperature range, uh, 70 to 85 degrees is typically optional, optimal, and adequate soil moisture so the ants are up in the mound and the chemical will readily move through the mound. Um, if you're out in a site wearing a coat and gloves like this person in the image here or using a hair dryer to warm the mound up, uh, that's probably not the best time to be doing a drench treatment. And if you break open the mound and you see the larvae of the ants near the surface of the mound, that's optimal time to apply a direct treatment like a, a con contact insecticide as a drench. Here's a chart showing seasonal uh, activity of ants. Uh, I've got uh, morning, midday, late afternoon, and night, and then fall, spring, summer, and winter. And um, and the fall is always going to be your optimal time for most treatments, uh, fall or spring. That's when, uh, during most of the day, the temperatures are favorable enough that you're going to find the ants up high in the mound, morning all the way to late afternoon. And even at nighttime in the fall and spring, the ants a lot of times will not be that far down in the mound. Um, summer, they're going to be limited more to morning and late afternoon. Uh, midday, they're going to be deeper in the mound and at night uh, also. Winter, uh, midday may be the only time that's optimal for applying a treatment because early in the morning and night they're going to be really deep in the mound. Uh, late afternoon they'll be somewhat um, deeper in the mound, but uh, 
I think probably midday would be optimal. And again, winter is really not the optimal time to be doing these treatments. Other sites that might be challenging for uh, fire ant treatments, uh, sensitive sites near water, uh, play areas where you have children, um, sites where there's honeybees or other thing, other insects of concern. Um, there are some treatments that can kill fire ant mounds. Uh, they're not highly effective, but uh, pouring hot water on the mound is probably about 75% effective. Um, you need to get the water fairly hot. Of course, the hazard with this is you need to avoid scalding yourself when you're applying it. This type of treatment has no residual activity, obviously, because there's no chemical involved. Um, it can kill the grass, and more than likely, you're going to have to retreat the colony if you do this. The, the advantage of something like this is obviously there's no toxicant going into the environment. You could do this right next to a pond, even with no no issue at all. Uh, there's a number of biopesticides listed on the e extension website, and I've got the link right here to those. Uh, a lot of these are plant oil based, and uh, if you're using anything like this, be uh, aware of the fact that some of these plant oils, like uh, pyrethrins, can be extremely toxic to fish, uh, just as toxic as a commercial insecticide. So just because they're a biopesticide doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe for all sites. And they would have label recommendations that you would also need to carefully follow. Um, I've also observed that some plant-based uh, biopesticides can be uh, quite toxic to grass. Uh, this was a treatment that we applied a couple of years ago, and it, it really harmed the lawn. You can also uh, manually dig up a mound and put the ants in a bucket of soapy water and drown them. Um, if you're going to dig up a fire ant colony, I would recommend that you uh, baby powder your boots and wear uh, protective uh, latex gloves. You can also powder the handles of the shovel to keep the ants from crawling up on you while you're extracting the mound. Um, issues with this also, you're going to likely have, uh, you're not going to get all of the ants in the colony when you do this. You've also got workers that are out foraging in the environment. Uh, these are going to be coming back, and they're going to be likely to reestablish a micro mound at that site. So this is not also a very highly effective method, but it will work. Uh, mound disruption right before cold weather is another technique that can, can give a little bit of mortality. If you have a cold front coming and the temperatures have been warm, you can get out there right before the cold front comes and tear the mound up with a hoe or a rake or some type of tractor equipment and you actually get a little bit of mortality because you're disrupting their home right before the cold weather arrives. Colonies that are near project protected objects, like where they can retreat up under pavement or concrete, these are going to be sites that are probably going to have to be baited to be effective. And some of those other sites I showed that were sensitive, uh, certain bait labels also will allow you to apply those if you're careful to apply the bait in a manner where it can't get into the water or and it's, and it's done according to label. You can mix and match some of these programs that we talked about earlier. Um, obviously a high intensity area like around the house would be a good area for a long residual treatment where you don't want ants, where you're going to have higher contact with the ants. This might be a site you would want maximum suppression. Uh, sites where the ants are widely scattered might be good sites for individual mound treatments. If the ants have been concentrated along a fence line, these would be good sites for a uh, long residual broadcast or a two-step method. And anywhere near sensitive sites like ponds or creeks might be a site where you would want to try something like a hot water treatment or a very careful use of bait so that it does not get into the water source. Just a few more things here. Uh, I'll go through these pretty quick, but some research that we've done in recent years that is kind of relevant to some of the things I've talked about today. Uh, this was actually a mound drench test that we did at a commercial nursery, and each one of these yellow flags in the image was a fire ant colony. And we did have a few colonies that were along the roadside, which were challenging sites to treat. And what's not so important is the different chemicals I used here, but that uh, each of these colonies was treated with two gallons of drench. We didn't bait the site before treating. We went out and ranked all of the colonies for size, small, medium, or large, and we, we mapped all of them with a GPS unit. And I, 
just want to point out, chemical-wise, we had two broad classes of chemicals that we were testing, a pyrethroid and an organophosphate. And this is a, a, GPS or a GIS map of the mounds at the site. Each one of these dots represents a fire ant mound. And the size of the dot represents the size of the colony. So the larger the dot, the bigger the colony. And we had basically large, medium, or small colonies. And I'm going to show you the results of this uh, just for this one concentrated area here that I just highlighted with some shading. This is a close-up of that site showing the small, the medium, and the large mounds. The ones that were white only got water. The ones that were red got the organophosphate, and the ones that were yellow got the pyrethroid. And this is what happened one day after treatment. Um, we still had colonies out there uh, that had been treated with chemical, uh, but most of the colonies that remained were the control colonies. And then we have some of these little triangles that I added to the map. Uh, those are new colonies that appeared after the treatment. And if we add an image here that shows you what colony or what was near that triangle the day before, uh, that's what these little hatch lines show. Every one of those little new colonies is next to where a mound was treated the day before with a pesticide. And this is something that I run into a lot with drench treatments. Uh, fire ants relocate right after they're treated. You don't kill the colony outright. Um, and I'm not going to show much more on this. Uh, I'll just kind of skim through these because I think I'm getting kind of late on my time here. But uh, this is three days after treatment. Uh, we still have uh, these micro colonies with the triangles. And seven days after treatment, uh, there are still colonies uh, at the site following the drench treatment. But by and large, we're, we're finally starting to get rid of some of these colonies. And the white ones, the white dots up here, which were the non-treated water controls, they're still present also, as would be expected. The, these colonies that tended to produce these new smaller mounds following the treatment were the larger colonies. And that's what this graph here shows. Uh, most of the big mounds were the source of our new little teeny micro mounds that appeared following treatment. Another test we did, we looked at uh, directly drenching the mound or using a slow trickle drench system, which is a, basically a tree ring irrigation device. Uh, the direct drench watered the mound very thoroughly. I often washed the larvae right out of the mound as it was being applied. Trickle drench slowly uh, dripped on the mound surface, and it tended to create a dry zone in the middle and then a donut ring that was wet around that dry zone. And when we came back to rake these colonies, every time we probed in that dry area, ants came swarming out. So this type of method missed a good portion of the mound with the direct treatment. And these graphs here show some of the results of that. Uh, percent control on the y-axis and days after treatment on the bottom axis. We did have a bait and a non-baited uh, treatment in this test. Of that's really not what's important. Uh, what is important was at about five to 10 days post-treatment, the direct drench treatment gave us 100% control. And the trickle drench, we were all the way out to day 14 to day 21 before we got complete control. So I think what this is telling us here is if you don't get thorough treatment of that mound with your chemical solution, you're going to be less likely to kill the mound quickly. Another test, uh, looking at um, <clears throat> injection of a pesticide into the mound. And we did this at one, two, and five different points, depending. We had uh, one injection, two injections, or five injection treatments. Um, so one mound would get five holes, two holes, or one hole is what this image here shows. And they all got the same amount of chemical and the same concentration of chemical, just whether it was applied in more points or not. And this graph here shows um, as same as we saw a minute ago with the trickle drench data I was showing you. More, more injection points gave us more rapid control than less injection points. So again, more contact, more exposure to chemical, you get better control. <coughs> Finally, uh, some other methods that you can do to potentially control ants in your landscape. Uh, Habitat diversity is always a good thing. It encourages com competing ant species. 
Uh, fire ants don't like shade, so if you have a shady site, you're going to have less problems. Uh, protecting other beneficial insects when you can by avoiding these broadcast treatments uh, only as necessary. Uh, encouraging ant predators, uh, lots of birdhouses on your site. Uh, birds are pretty good predators of these winged uh, reproductives that are flying into the site. Avoiding pest plants that have uh, pest prone plants that have lots of aphids that might provide a food source for the ants. Using non preferred plants that have strong odors like mints and mulches that have strong repellents may give you some benefit in the landscape. Uh, reducing sources access to water like leaky faucets, uh, irrigation leakage, and uh, with any ant species it's important to have good sanitation. You don't want to be leaving lots of food products around on the property, uh, garbage and such. Uh, using gravel instead of sand because uh, it's a little bit less conducive for nesting than sand. And frequent disturbance is another method to actually shift the ants to certain locations where you might be able to make a treatment. So, Finally, um, there's lots of resources on the extension Ported Fire Ant Community to Practices website. Uh, and I've got the link right here for that. All of the different pesticides I've talked about today and methods are all can be found on this website. And that pretty much concludes my talk. I would like to again acknowledge some of my laboratory assistants and graduate students that assisted with uh, pictures and some of the research we did as well. Thank you. Dr. Oliver, we appreciate that uh, thorough presentation on fire ants. I'm going to ask Jenny at this time if she'd post our, our uh, follow-up poll questions. Um, if they pop up on your screen, you'll be able to click those and answer those. There's about 117 of us on this, so uh, 117 answers would be good. If you have additional questions for Dr. Oliver, if you'll Post those in the chat box to the left. We'll try to get those as we go along. In addition, when we finish this uh, four four question poll here, Lucy's going to post a link to the Qualtrics survey, some more in depth survey of today's webinar, as well as provide us some feedback on future webinar topics and and other ideas. Please take the time to click on that link and uh, uh, fill out that Qualtrics survey uh, af after the webinar. Um, Again, I uh, appreciate Dr. Oliver uh, for uh, presenting today. Please mark your calendars for next month, April 1st. We'll have uh, our webinar on Help Pollinators Cope with Pesticides, as well as May 6th, Managing Pests of Backyard Pecans. Again, this 2016 All Bugs, Good and Bad webinar series is uh, brought to you by the E-Extension Communities of Practice, Imported Fire Ants, Urban IPM, and by the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, Clemson Cooperative Extension, and the University of Georgia. Okay, let's see. I believe uh, still got a few answers coming in, but I believe we've got a good uh, follow-up on our four-question surveys. Again, uh, appreciate everybody showing up, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Oliver for the presentation. Um, if you have further questions, just post them in the chat box, and several of us will be around uh, for a few minutes to answer those. Uh, again, thank you for your participation, and that wraps up today's webinar. Thank you. <laughs>